It's the fall of 2020. It's week two. It is Tuesday. And here we go. Uh, we were talking about aldosterone. Is this the right lecture? Yep, it is. We, didn't, we just started talking about aldosterone. Uh, so aldosterone, remember, is a hormone. It's re released by the adrenal gland, specifically uh, the zona glomerulosa, specifically, more specifically, granulosa cells. It circulates through the blood. Eventually, one of its targets uh, beside the heart, remember, we also talked about how it can damage the heart along with angiotensin too, but it circulates through the bloodstream and reaches the kidneys. Now it doesn't usually ride alone, uh, it usually jumps on the back of albumin, uh, so those are transport proteins. 60% of the time in fact albumin carries it. 35% of the time it's uh, free of a carrier, so some of it's free, some of it's on albumin. <coughs> uh, it can also reach other tissue. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so we should talk about the principal cells again. Um, that Those are, where are those principal cells? Here's the principal cells. They live in this region of the collecting duct here, specifically the cortical portion of the collecting duct. Uh, they also live in the very distal part of the distal convoluted tubule. Guyton calls them the late distal tubules. Other authors call them the late distant convoluted tubules. Other authors call them the connecting tubules. Uh, so take your pick. All right, uh, let's see, I got all this. And the principal cells are the targets we said, and they're found mainly in the connecting tubules. I think we just said all that stuff, so I got that. Some authors just say they're located uh, in the nephron or the distal part of the nephron. That's another one I've heard. Confusing, I know. Uh, where does it bind and what's the story? So how does it attach to these principal cells? Well, it has mineral corticoid receptors, uh, which I usually just call MR receptors, which are located on the basal lateral surface uh, of the principal cell. Remember the basal lateral surface? Why they call it lateral in there, I have no idea. They just, just call it basal surface, but they always do that. That just means the bottom of a cell. Like here's the run-of-the-mill cell here. Oh, let's give it a cilia. Why not? Uh, they, and there's a tube here. This is the basal lateral surface, this bottom part here. This is the lateral surface. This is the apical surface up here. If it's connected to a tube, you can call that the luminal surface. Basal lateral surface also means there's an interstitium right here, and then there's a blood vessel microcirculation very close, a capillary close to it. Uh, so things that go through this cell can jump, swim through the interstitium and get right into the blood vessel really quickly. All right, um, so when aldosterone binds to these MR receptors on the basal lateral surface of principal cells, what happens? Uh, it causes, a bunch of stuff happens, but specifically, uh, we'll talk about this story, uh, it causes the expression of ENAC channels. Those are epithelial sodium channels, affectionately known as ENAC channels. Uh, and they're put on the luminal surface, or the apical surface, should be surface, of cells, uh, of these principal cells. Now, that let's go back. What does that mean, increased expression? That's the central dogma, right? So the binding of aldosterone, uh, it stimulates a cascade, which we're not going to talk about it, uh, that ultimately causes the genes to be transcribed, a gene uh, for ENAC channels gets transcribed into mRNA and that floats out of the cell, finds a ribosome and it's made, the ENAC channel is flat out made and then the ENAC channel is transported over to the luminal surface of the cell and implanted. So that's what expression means in case you don't know that. Um, these are the only channels that are involved with aldosterone dependent sodium transport by the way.
right? Pictures are always best. Uh, so here's the the new urine, newly formed urine, aka the filtrate, and we have an aldosterone molecule binding right here to an MR receptor, and that stimulates the implanting of this ENAC channel down here. This ENAC channel is allowing sodium to diffuse down its concentration gradient into the cell. But we haven't talked about. So now we got sodium in the cell. How do we get sodium out of the cell? Well, another type of channel is made called the potassium, or the sodium potassium ATPases are also made by that binding. So let's take a look at how that works. Because once we got sodium out here, we've accomplished our goal, right? We know aldosterone causes the reabsorption of sodium. Have we reabsorbed sodium from the filtrate? We sure have. There's a huge amount of sodium here. All right, we concentrate sodium. We suck water out of the, the, the ascending limb, the thick ascending limb, uh, and it concentrates sodium. So sodium's happy to rush down its concentration gradient, rush right out of the cell into the interstitium, and then it keeps right going into the capillary. Right, so ENAC chat allows sodium to rush in, goes down its concentration and its electrochemical gradient. I forgot the electro, there's electrical gradient as well, all that positive charge, positive, positive, repels each other. Now how do we get sodium out of the, bo uh, out of the back, bottom of the cell? Kind of spoiled the surprise, but uh, the binding also stimulates the expression. There's that word again, so it goes through the central dogma. And we make sodium potassium ATPase pumps or transporters. And those are on the basal lateral surface, the bottom of the cell, the interstitial side of the cell. And now the sodium is actively pumped out, and it costs an ATP. This is not uh, a, 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 a passive process. Might have said that it's not. Sodium ATPase is cost energy. So we do have to burn an ATP to have that happen. But we got plenty of ATP around. All right, so sodium enters the renal interstitium, it gets sucked up into the distal capillary, and who follows? Water. And we'll look at how water follows through its aquaporins channels. And that's going to boost up your blood pressure, right? Because if you get sodium and water, more water entering your blood increases the volume, and there goes your blood pressure. And by the way, this is a great physiology question. What is the rate limiting step? Uh, of aldosterone, of increasing pressure. Where's the bottleneck? The bottleneck is uh, right here. It's actually the uh, the manufacturing of the sodium potassium ATPase pumps. It's not the ENEC channels. They can make those lickety split really fast, uh, but not. Huh, do we say that word lickety split? I haven't said that in a long word, a long time. <coughs> but that's the, the rate limiting step. Right. Just another example. Aldosterone binds. Uh, and then, so this is the, let's see where we're at here. Um, oh, I see. There's, so it's just this piece of the cell. Because this could be going on over here as well. Uh, but there's an ENAC channel was made. And then a sodium potassium ATPase pump is made. And so I think we got the story there, right? Um, oh, that's just to show the. Uh, the millivolts and there's a there's a electrical gradient as well that it tends to go down. It's a nice picture for these ROMK channels and BK channels. We'll talk about those in a while. A bit. <clears throat> so water follows, of course, as I said. Water tries to follow sodium, uh, and it does. It moves through uh, several types of channels. Aquaporins two channels are in the in the luminal side, and aquaporins two and three. Those guys are always there. I don't think they have to be made. We'll see on my slides here, but I'm pretty sure they're there. Uh, but that's it moves through these aquaporins channels. And uh, we already said blood pressure increases, or blood pressure is increased via the increased water. I mean, that's kind of out of place, but... All right, so here's aquaporins. Two channels are uh, inserted here. And water comes in. And water goes right out aquaporins three, four channels here. We'll talk more about aquaporins two when we talk about ADH. Um, but that's the story there. Uh, the same thing, the binding of aldosterone caused this, the making of aquaporins two to be laid in here. Uh, ADH also stimulates the making 
the quote expression of aquaporins 2. Aquaporins 3 4 are always built in there. And I'll, if I'm wrong on that, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but we'll look at that more when we talk about ADH next time. All right, what about potassium? So we know aldosterone has an effect with potassium, right? There's an exchange. Sodium comes in, somebody's got to replace it, and potassium gets the boot as sodium comes uh, comes in. So sodium is driven out of the cytosol of principal cells into the urine or into the lumen <coughs> of the collecting duct or the distal distal part of the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, and it's done so to keep charges consistent because we lose hydrogen or we lose a positive charge. We want to replace the positive charge. It uses two channels. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these channels. I don't know if Dr. Doe talked about them, but there's the RAMK channel which stands for renal outer medullary potassium channel. So it'd be great if they in boards if they printed that whole channel out because that tells you exactly what it does. My guess is this is a case where they will use this acronym ROMK channel. And the BK channel stand for high conductance big potassium channels. That's from Guyton. Again, I think they're gonna use the uh the the symbols here instead of the actual words because that tells you what they do. Uh, but let's take a look at how those work. So the binding of aldosterone, uh, it creates the same thing. It causes the expression of, well we said that array, sodium. And it also causes the expression of BK and ROMK channels. So they have to be made and then they're laid down uh, in the luminal side or the apical side, whichever you prefer, of the cell. Uh, and that allows sodium to move out of the cell to replace the positive charge uh, going here. And there's also a buildup. Uh, we'll look at this sodium potassium ATPase pump. When sodium goes out here, potassium comes into the cell and it starts to build up. So you start to get a concentration gradient of potassium here, which also encourages it to kind of get out of the cell. You probably know this already, right? Uh, what about inter alpha intercalated cells? There are other types of cells in the, the the connecting tubules and the cortical portion of the collecting ducts, and not just principal cells. So scattered amongst these principal cells, we have these alpha intercalated cells. Uh, so what do they do? They also have uh, mineral corticoid receptors, MR receptors for aldosterone. And these are the ones that kick hydrogen ion out. So the one and easy board question is, uh, we know that sodium and water are reabsorbed from the principal cell in response to aldosterone. We know potassium and hydrogen ion are kicked out, kicked into the urine, into the filtrate. But the trick is here that hydrogen ion is not kicked out. It does not, it's not processed I like the other three. It's processed through its own type of cell called an alpha intercalated cell. Okay, so super important for acid base homeostasis in the body. Side note, the potato pickers, the proximal convoluted tubules are are other are, are the other component of this acid base homeostasis. That's where 90% of the bicarbonate is uh, removed uh, from the actually from the potato picker cells in the proximal convoluted tubules. Not going to get into that though. I think Dr. Dole, I'm sure he covered all this stuff already. Alpha, and somebody let me know too, by the way, is this new to you or you've had this before, right? One of these days I'd like to take all this out of here so I can focus more on pathology, but you've probably forgot it. Anyway, aldosterone's binding stimulates these cells to excrete hydrogen ion into the lumen. How does it do so? It does so by these hydro or by hydrogen potassium uh, or I'm sorry, hydrogen ATPase pumps. Basically the same type of proton pump that's in the parietal cells uh, of your stomach, uh, which we will talk about a lot when the time comes. So hydrogen ATPases, aka proton pumps. Uh, so same deal. The binding causes the expression of these cells. They have to be made of these these pumps uh, and they're laid down. Um, some leave through hydrogen potassium pumps as well. So there's two types 
hydrogen ATPases and hydrogen potassium pump hydrogen potassium uh, pump ATPases as well so one's just hydrogen one's a hydrogen potassium look at a picture here in a second uh, and that and of course we know that if you kick hydrogen ion out of the blood it's going to raise the pH make it more basic okay so here's our aldosterone coming in here's uh, an intercalated cell uh, right here uh, and it stimulates a hydrogen ATPase pump here to pump hydrogen out and it also stimulates the expression of a hydrogen potassium ATPase so we have a hydrogen ATPase and a hydrogen potassium ATPase both doing the job uh, kicking hydrogen ion out into the urine right here okay bicarbonate is also being exchanged and kicked out the other side so is chloride is being kicked out the other side uh, but we're not going to worry too much about that all right what about aldosterone in the GI system remember I said that the, uh, the intestine and the large intestine it wasn't known for a long time uh, it took it was well probably about 20 years now but it, for a long time when I went to school that they didn't even this wasn't even around didn't realize that the the print the, the enterocytes and the colonocytes had anything to do with it but they're they're like principal cells in a way you can think of the intestine is just uh, a collecting duct really and it acts the same way there's binding sites for aldosterone and it does the same thing it sucks in salt and water and it kicks in hydrogen ion and potassium just like your kidney it's not as big of a mechanism as the kidney but it definitely works and if it's broken uh, if you don't reabsorb salt and water that's gonna pass right on through and instead of polyuria making too much urine when that happens in the kidney you're gonna have diarrhea because your stools are gonna be too watery so that's basically the deal with that uh, so it binds aldosterone binds to epithelial cells specifically enterocytes and colonocytes in the small intestine and ascending colon is the one where this uh, works uh, some research shows the other parts of the colon as well uh, Guyton just shows the ascending colon so let's go with that and uh, it uses a NHE3 transporter and then there's another mechanism that's not exactly sure so it's not the same type of cells that we or transporters we just talked about the mechanism is still not completely understood except for these transporters um, but it uh, the binding causes the reabsorption of salt and water from the fecal material and it causes the trade for potassium and hydrogen and that's because everything else we don't really the story is still kind of unfolding with regard to transporters and such therefore people with hyperaldosteronism if you don't have enough aldosterone around one of the signs is diarrhea so you get polyuria on the other end from the kidneys because you're not reabsorbing salt and water so too much water goes out and you're urinating all the time and then on the other end you have diarrhea makes sense uh, same deal it also stimulates the salivary glands and the sweat glands uh, to retain salt and water uh, from their lumens uh, so and people with hyperaldosteronism uh, if you have too much there's too much retention of salt and water you don't make sweat very good so you develop what's called hypohidrosis which is a lack of sweating and around here it's probably not that big of a deal but you're down near the equator you rely heavily on that sweat to keep the core of your body cool uh, sweat is important uh, mechanism for relieving heat from your body and people can suffer increased chance for heat stroke down there if they have hyperaldosteronism the opposite side of the coin and cystic fibrosis uh, they actually get too much sodium and not enough water in their sweat and did we talk about that yet I think we will eventually that's right we're just starting these quarters are starting to blend together because I can't see your faces anymore when I do this uh, but we will talk about cystic fibrosis and how do you rec what's the number one uh, way who discovers that their child has cystic fibrosis their mom does uh, moms are always kissing their babies and they start to taste really salty that's not a good sign 
that means they have cystic fibrosis and it definitely shortens the life to 30 getting closer to 40 years now but it takes about half of the life away and it's a life and not a great life you're in the hospital a lot how does potassium end up in the urine uh, I guess that was a little side note how do yeah I guess I should have put the intestinal stuff later um, how does how do you get rid of potassium well, we just talked about that, didn't we? Um, I don't know. Uh, increased potassium serum concentration. So if you have too much potassium in the blood. Oh, I guess we didn't talk. Well, we've talked about this before, right? Uh, if you have too much potassium, then it's going to trigger the release of aldosterone. Remember, potassium can flat out bind uh, with glomerulosa cells. In the zone of glomerulosis, that's and that's one of the most powerful stimulators of the release of aldosterone. So, if you have hyperkalemia, uh, you are going to be secreting aldosterone like crazy, and then aldosterone will stimulate the uh, expression of the sodium potassium ATPase pumps in the basal lateral surface of the principal cell. Uh, potassium then rushes down from the interstitium into the principal cell builds up a huge, we talked about this already, huge concentration gradient. Uh, it also stimulates the expression of ROMK and BK channels. My slides are sorry about that, are a little out of order because we already talked about this. But that's the way it finds itself out. Um, now with the way in and way out, it simply goes down its concentration gradient. Yeah, we've talked about that. Okay, how about sodium regulation? Uh, aldosterone is the principal regulator of sodium however this is I always test you on this so pot potassium can bind to, gr uh, to uh, granulosa cells and directly cause the release of aldosterone sodium even though aldosterone is the principal regulator it cannot bind directly to granulosa cells say that again sodium cannot bind directly to granulosa cells uh, it has to do so via you know how, how does it do so the R2A system right that's the way it triggers so how do you clear excess salt from the body um, well the kidney clears it but yeah the kidney is the one that does it uh, because if you have excess salt in your bloodstream you're going to increase uh, the amount of water in your bloodstream uh, so water will be sucked out of cells uh, to meet that extra salt and you slightly increase your blood pressure and let's see because if you have increased blood pressure it's not going to stimulate the release of renin here I always have trouble with this section because um, I know this the kidney will actually clear s excess of salt uh, by itself. Uh, so water will move out of cells increases. Uh, so increased blood pressure does two things. Uh, it turns off the R2A system and it turns on the natri natriuretic system. That's not very good. I'm going to have to go back and probably take that out because that's not my my understanding is it's the salt is just removed by the potato pickers all the extra salt that's coming through yeah let me let me work on that I know that one's not on the test because I'm always stumble on that one actually Guyton's not very clear on that one um, there are some other ways though to to lose sodium if you have uh, hyperhidrosis if you sweat too much uh, you lose salt that way. If you have cystic fibrosis, you definitely can uh, become hypokalemic. If your intestines conditions that irritate your enterocytes and colonic sites, uh, like a gastroenteritis, if you irritate those cells, they stop working. They stop sucking up salt and water, and you can get diarrhea and lose sodium. Uh, through all of these conditions, gastroenteritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. All right, let's get to hyperaldosteronism. We've been kind of talking about it, so this should be pretty easy, although we don't know what really causes it. So 
chronic increased levels of aldosterone in the blood is called hyperaldosteronism. Watch out for this AKA. Sometimes it's just called aldosteronism and they don't put a hyper or hypo. So if we just see aldosteronism, that means hyperaldosteronism. Okay, watch out for that one. Condition is typically caught uh, by working up a new hypertension. So your patient's 45 years old, all of a sudden they got hypertension out of the blue. They never had it before in their life. You say, you know what, we better we better get an ultrasound and check those adrenal glands. Um, of course, too much aldosterone causes the usual suspects, with, which we've already talked about a couple of times. Uh, so too much aldosterone will cause the reabsorption of salt and water, so you're going to have the hypertension. Uh, you're going to have a hypernatremia, too much. These are going to be slight levels at for usually, but you'll have too much salt around. You'll also have hypokalemia because sodium is getting kicked out too much, and your too much hydrogen ion is going to be kicked out, so you get metal, uh, metabolic alkalosis, right? Or you're going to have increased blood pressure. P students always screw this up, even on these easier uh, online tests. You make sure you don't get uh, that uh, decreased blood hydrogen ion, people think it causes decreased pH. If you if you don't think about it carefully, remember they're inverse. I'm sure that won't happen to you though. The decreased plasma levels of renin also occurs with too much aldosterone. Um, yep, because you're you're turning on, you're making hypertension that shuts off the R2A system. And the big one, you're going to damage the heart, the cardiovascular system. Uh, so that's no good. Some fun facts about aldosteronism. Uh, it is the most common cause of secondary hypertension. And so people are initially caught, the hypertension is caught, and they get worked up usually an ultrasound. The adrenal gland catches it. About 18% or about 8% of people who were initially diagnosed with hypertension get a workup and they find out they have secondary uh, secondary hypertension due to hyperaldosteronism. Could also be from renal artery stenosis too but we'll look at the number one cause here in a second. Uh, the diagnosis in 18 percent of patients with treatment resistant hypertension. So here's a patient who gets hypertension and the doc starts treating it and they're trying to find a cause for it uh, and the medication doesn't work. Uh, it's resistant to the medication. That's never a great sign. And 18%, almost 20% of them, uh, the problem comes out to be hyperaldosteronism, usually from uh, Kahn syndrome, which we'll look at quickly right here. And we'll recap that next week. There's two subtypes. There's primary hyperaldosteronism or primary aldosteronism, aka that's what's going to be on board. I'm convinced Kahn syndrome. They're not going to tell you hyperaldosteronism because that gives it away. They're going to say Kahn syndrome. And then there's a secondary aldosteronism or hyperaldosteronism, which we'll get to next time. But let's start Kahn syndrome here. Kahn syndrome means that the adrenal gland is the culprit. The adrenal gland is overproducing aldosterone. Uh, so, and it's very important to catch this early too, right? A side note here, uh, because the uh, uh, because it will, the aldosterone itself uh, will damage the heart. So it has to be caught and you have to block that or fix the problem. The exam findings of someone with Kahn syndrome, well, same thing. You have increased serum levels of aldosterone. They typically have a pretty high hypertension, not malignant hypertension, but uh, quite high, 160 over 100. Uh, the ratio I like this ratio. I'm sure boards like these ratio questions as well. Uh, what's the aldosterone to renin ratio in someone with Kahn syndrome? Well, Kahn syndrome is the adrenal gland is cranking out too much aldosterone. So comparatively, the aldosterone will be high and the renin will be low, right? Because we know aldosterone is going to increase the blood pressure, so renin is going to be shut off. Now, what if I flip that around? What, what's the renin to aldosterone ratio? Well, that would be low, right? So you have to be able to do a little mathematics. So I think you think about that. Be careful with that. That can be tricky. 
because you never know what they're going to say. Are they going to say the Renin to aldosterone ratio or the aldosterone to Renin ratio? So you've got to put in your thinking caps uh, for that one. All right, what other exam findings? Well, just too much aldosterone around. So they're going to have hypokalemia, right? Too much potassium was kicked out. Clinically speaking, they may have um, some heart problems with that. Uh, we'll look at that more when we talk about that. Uh, they may have alkalosis, too much hydrogen ions been kicked out. What's the cause of Kahn syndrome? Uh, the number one cause, about 60% of the time, according to Robbins, uh, is something called IAH, idiopathic adrenal gland hyperplasia. And basically what that is, is you have non-cancerous glandular tumors which have grown uh, and it's you can see them I mean, under the microscope you could see all these glands but they collectively present with these big ugly balls here and those are filled with glomerulosa freak glomerulosa cells which have no control they're just cranking out they're cranking out aldosterone like crazy and nobody can control them and so that's the problem they're filled with these ugly adenomas uh, of um, granulosa cells and they can't be shut off they're usually not cancerous occasionally this can be cancerous but usually not alright so that is the end of this lecture good morning my wife has awoken from her slumber and thanks for watching this and we'll see you guys in the next one and just to let my wife know, the microphone is still on so she doesn't say anything crazy. Well, I shut this thing down here.